Okay. When the right lower quadrant ultrasound fails to show findings of appendicitis, you need to look elsewhere. So look at the pelvis, particularly in female adolescents, as gynecologic conditions can mimic appendicitis. And we'll look at that in the next talk. And also look at the upper abdomen. We said appendicitis accounted for 22 to 25 percent of diseases. There are other uh, causes of acute pain, gynecologic, bowel, 10 percent, pyelonephritis, pneumonia, constipation, gastrointestinal disease, 10 percent of alternative diagnoses when appendicitis is suspected. And the diagnoses include bowel disease, Crohn's disease, infection, hematoma purpura, mechal diverticulum, mesenteric adenitis, and intussusception. We do not see the diseases that we see in adults. So Crohn's disease, even infection, simply thick wall bowel. One layer of the bowel measures greater than three millimeters, which is the normal cutoff, typically between four and six millimeter thickness. Both sides are effective, but when we do measurements, we're talking about measuring one wall. It's slightly compressible. It doesn't have a blind ending, and it's hypervascular. Looking for the blind ending is key, and you may see nodes. This is Chrome. Infectious enteritis is another cause of right lower quadrant pain. It can be viral or bacterial. Ultrasound usually normal and viral infection. And bacterial infection, you may see wall thickening in nodes. You cannot exclude it from Crohn's disease. They're going to need cultures. So how about this 15-year-old girl with diarrhea and pain? This is bowel. You can see the walls are thick. Some air in the luma, lots of color. Um, this turned out to be infection. E. coli enteritis, but it certainly could be Crohn's as well. I mean, we're good at identifying bowel wall thickening, not necessarily saying what the cause is. This is another one. Henoxone purpura affects young children, first decade. It's a small vessel vasculitis. It affects the skin, the inner rash, small bowel, kidney, joints, and it can cause extreme abdominal pain due to a hematoma or intussusception, or just the fact there's a vasculitis and it's involved the bowel wall. So once again, you get thickened bowel. Looks like the other cases I showed you. And it involves the duodenum, jejunum, ileum, any place. And it's very vascular. Okay. Now the clue here is that it's a younger patient. So you might think about you know, shell and purpura and look for the rash. Um, but certainly infection could look like this in a rare case of Crohn. Mechal diverticulum can mimic appendicitis. It's the most common anomaly of the GI tract, affecting 2 to 3 percent of the population. 60 percent of patients, 60 percent, with mechal diverticulum present in the first decade, and they present with um, pain due to inflammation, gets it inflamed, or maybe into susception. And the diverticulum is a remnant of the omphalomesenteric duct. And the duct in utero connects the bowel to the umbilicus. And normally it disappears. But if the proximal end stays open, you've got a mechal diverticulum. It arises from the terminal ileum, not the cecum, within 10 centimeters of the ileal cecal valve. It is blind ending. This is it. It'll do a target sign on the short axis, and it likes the right lower quadrant, or it may be midline. So this is, should be, not 72, 12-year-old girl with right lower quadrant pain and vomiting. And we saw this too. It's blind ending, but when you trace it back, it came from the ileum. And we did a CT to prove it. Here is the cecum. This is the diverticulum coming from the ileum. And here's another one, target sign. This is laying it out. This is a blind any tube coming from the ileum. So when you see a blind any tube, even the appendix, trace it back. Make sure it does come from the cecum. Mesenteric adenitis mimics appendicitis. It's self-limited. 
Normally, they're given something for pain. It will disappear in a couple of days. It's a benign inflammation of lymph nodes within the mesentery. It likes young children and young adults, sort of like the same age range as appendicitis, often viral, but occasionally bacterial. And it's nothing more than a collection of lymph nodes. The strict diagnosis requires seeing more than three lymph nodes in the right lower quadrant on the mesenteric root, and they have to be greater than five millimeters in short axis, and that the normal appendix and bowel are seen. One lymph node that's enlarged does not allow the diagnosis of mesenteric adenitis. And if you turn color on, you see the characteristic flow in the central hilum, just like any other lymph node. And finally, intussusception is a cause of acute pain. It's prolapse of one segment of the bowel of the intussusceptum into another, and it causes acute pain in early childhood, okay? Early childhood. Under three years, 90% are ileocolic. The remainder may be ileo iliocolic, colocolic, or ileo, ileo. But this is what you're commonly going to see. 90% are idiopathic and have no leap uh, point. And they're just due to hypertrophy of uh, prior patches, small nodes. So typically three months to three years. 10% older children, they have abdominal pain, may have vomiting and bloody stool. And this is an intussusception. Ilium going into colon, and the total length is usually 8.5 centimeters. And on ultrasound, you're going, and typically you see it because it's ilium going into the colon and the right abdomen. You're going to see multiple layers, the target sign, the bullseye sign. And if you lay it out, you've got the pseudo kidney sign. Okay, it's an ovoid, sort of like a kidney, at least that's what they call it. Here's another one, the target sign. You write abdomen, and you lay it out, you've got the pseudo-kidney sign. That is intussusception. Turn color on. If the bowel is viable, you're going to see lots of color. And it's sort of helpful if you're going to go ahead and try to reduce this because it tells you that you have viable bowel, and this is usually reducible. Here's another one. There's no flow. We made an attempt. A reduction, it didn't work, and that was ischemic bowel at surgery. Lead points, 10% of patients, more common in older children. The lead points include mechal diverticulum, polyp, hamartoma, duplication cyst, and lymphoma. And ultrasound, you're just going to see a mass and the intussusception. Here is the intussusception, a multi-layered mass, right abdomen, right upper quadrant, not right lower quadrant. This echogenic part is the mesentery that goes along with the bowel. This is a mass. That was a hamartoma. This is an intussusception target sign, multiple layers. The echogenic part is the mesentery omentum. And this was a polyp. Here's another intussusception, multiple layers. There's an anechoic mass in this intussusception. That's a duplication cyst. The ultrasound factors that predict that you're going to have difficulty reducing this, if you see absent blood flow, I showed you that. If you have a large amount of fluid in the central intussusception, it's a bad sign. If you see a lot of trapped lymph nodes in the intussusception, and if there's a lead mass. Sensitivity, 94 to 100%. Specificity, up to 100%. Occasionally, fecal contents, inflammatory bowel disease, hematoma will mimic intussusception. This patient had acute pain, and we thought maybe that was intussusception. Did an enema, this turned out to be a colitis. And the differential is the other intussusception, transient intussusception. It occurs in the left upper quadrant, a life synergogenum. It's very short. Uh, compared to the standard intussusception, which is much larger, it resolves spontaneously, and it's a leave-alone lesion. Don't touch it. It's going to go away. So these patients uh, had pain. 
we do look at the right lower quadrant, but we also look, as I mentioned, in the entire abdomen. If we don't find something in the right lower quadrant, this was in the left upper quadrant. It's a target appearance. It's an insusception. It's small. Another one, it's small. Those are transient insusceptions. We feel comfortable with that. We leave it alone. As I mentioned, there are a few other diseases you occasionally may see, pyelonephritis, pneumonia, constipation. We're not going to see this well in ultrasound, but we do scan the entire abdomen. We look at both kidneys, we look at the liver, the gallbladder, pancreas, and we trace the bowel. This is a patient with acute right-sided pain, and the reason is pyelonephritis. Here's an echogenic area in the kidney and no flow on Doppler. That's acute pyelonephritis. So to sum it up, we discussed some of the common causes of acute right lower quadrant pain. Appendicitis, 20-25% of the diagnosis, blind in the tube with lots of color. Once it becomes ischemic, you see secondary findings and you may, may lose flow. We talked about other causes, mimics, bowel disease, and mesenteric adenitis, a cluster of lymph nodes. Bowel disease, we did mention. We talked about Crohn's disease. This is Crohn's disease, but we said infection can look the same. We talked about the diverticulum, the mechal diverticulum, and the fact that it arises from the ileum and not the cecum. And finally, we brought in into susception the world target appearance. Uh, classically right upper quadrant because it's ilium going into colon. So to finish this talk, appendicitis is always the diagnosis that's requested on the um, for us you know, the examination. But you'll see that up to 25% of the time. You'll see other diagnoses related to bowel or GYN. We're going to look at GYN uh, shortly. And then most cases, many cases, you're not going to make a diagnosis, probably viral. Well done ultrasound is a great tool, and it does allow a correct diagnosis in the majority of patients. It's just a matter of looking for the clues.